Well, I'll tell you what, the book of 1 John has been such a privilege to be able to study. This is a power-packed little book, and I think we might clearly say that it has been challenging. It is calling us to go deeper into our relationship with the Lord, and we're in many ways just getting started. This week, we have a wonderful text. We're going to be looking at the second chapter, verses 18 through 29, and then it's going to continue to get better uh, in the uh, following weeks. But let us now read the Word of God together. If you want to look at 1 John chapter 2, I'm going to begin in verse 18, and we'll read this together. John, by the Spirit of God, says these words, Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have the anointing by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you received from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you, but his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has been taught you, abide in him. I want to first off look at this controversial term, Antichrist. This term has received a great amount of attention in popular culture. Wouldn't it be nice if as much attention that was given to this title of Antichrist was given to the rest of John's epistle, we would have a much more Christian uh, world. And so this simply means uh, one who is opposite to Christ. John even tells us in the text Uh, that he is warning by the Holy Spirit uh, that the church has understood that Antichrist is coming in the future, but in his day, many Antichrists were at work. This spirit of lawlessness was at work in the first century. And throughout history, there have been innumerable individuals who have been opposed to Christ. They have been opposite to him. There's a strong interpretive uh, tradition that began with the Reformers uh, that put a name to this chief Antichrist. They believed that it was the Bishop of Rome. They believed it was the Pope, and this is a very convincing argument. But I really believe for our purposes, and we would be best served this morning if we were to understand that John is writing the first century, He is writing to Christians who are struggling with early heresies and false teachers, and he is naming these antichrists here this morning. If we were to focus on this principle that he's teaching, this will prepare the church of Christ throughout all centuries, all generations, to identify who are those that are false teachers, who are those that have this spirit of antichrist, and if 
this is one singular individual who's supposed to come at the end of time, we will be able to identify this person if we simply understand and practice the things which John is stressing this morning. It is the function of Scripture that if we follow the Word of God, we're always going to be one step ahead of the enemy. We see that John has spoken to the church and he said that you have been told that the Antichrist is coming and that Antichrists are going to come into the, the world. I think of Genesis chapter 15, and there's plenty of places that we could look where the Lord prophesies, where he speaks about coming events. He told Abram in Genesis chapter 15 that there would be a time coming when his descendants would be enslaved for 400 years. And so isn't it wonderful when we walk with the Lord, as we follow the Spirit, as we follow the Scriptures, we are enlightened and we know what is coming before it comes. And so this is a principle that we see at play this morning. The point uh, that is uh, clear within the text is that if we follow the Spirit of God united with the Word of God, we have wisdom. We have spiritual discernment that gives us the ability to discern false teaching. It's a rather simple point. Whereas those who do not have the anointing are easily led away by false doctrines. The true children of God will see the spirit of Antichrist. They will see those who are opposite to Christ, false Christ, false hopes, as in the light of day. It will be plain to them because they walk in the light, because they follow the word of, of God. Yet those who do not have the spirit nor abide in the word of God will be susceptible to nearly endless false teachings and delusions and will be led every which way wherever the wind blows. In a dark and endlessly complex world, this is the world that we all know and recognize, what a privilege it is to have this anointing, to have this gift of the Holy Spirit, to have the light of the Word of God in order that we might be grounded, that we might stand firm, and we might spot out who are those who are working under the activity of Satan. The blind man, every single time, he is going to fall and stumble into the pit before him, but the man who has sight is going to be able to find a sure footing. He is going to stand strong and arrive at his destination every single time. And so the emphasis is that those who have the anointing will be able to discern whoever um, is of this Antichrist spirit. However, those um, who do not have this anointing uh, will not have this per uh, perception. Let's look at this term a little bit further, this idea of, of anointing. In the Old Testament, uh, prophets were anointed with oil at the beginning of their ministry. So were priests and kings. They were all anointed with oil at the commencement of their service. And um, as we continue here. Uh, John's particular use here is to connect this idea of being anointed with the giving of the Holy Spirit. I want us to look at uh, an Old Testament passage which illustrates this, 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. Uh, this is speaking of uh, David as he is anointed king of Israel 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward, 
And Samuel rose and went to Ramah. And what a beautiful passage this is at the beginning of his call when God Almighty, through his prophet Samuel, singles out David to be the king, to be the anointed one. As he is anointed, the spiritual right is exercised over him. The Spirit of God rushes upon him. This is the sense uh, by which the Apostle John uses this word anointing, and there are many other places with the Old Testament that would support this idea, as well as the way that it is used in the context of, of the New Testament. And so as we look at this amazing passage in 1 Samuel, as we look at the glory here of, of David, as, as the Spirit of God rushes upon him, let us be reminded that this is the Old Testament. And we live in the days of surpassing glory in the New Testament. We live in the time period of the Holy Spirit. As Peter quotes Joel in Acts 2, 17, he tells us, and in the last days it shall be God declares that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. So in the Old Testament, uh, there are select individuals who are anointed. There are select individuals who receive an indwelling, an empowerment of the Holy Spirit, but it is not until the current time period, the age of the church, which Joel prophesies about, when all flesh, those who are in the body of Christ, will receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. This is a wonderful thing to consider. Perhaps the most interesting thing as we consider this concept of anointing is to reflect upon Jesus, who is the anointed one. In the New Testament, he's referred to as the Messiah, which is a Hebrew word that simply means anointed. He is the anointed one who was prophesied to come also, the word Christ is simply the Greek word, which is transliterated, and it is uh, referring to the anointed one. And so, Jesus is the anointed. He is the prophet, priest, king. He is the chosen one of the Father. He is the one who has been endued with power from on high by the Holy Spirit. And then, very interestingly, we see that we are the followers of Christ, the anointed one. Here, John points out that we are to be a holy race. In a sense, we are the priesthood. We are that all flesh, the fulfillment of that. And so we are a people who are anointed. We are the representation of Christ, the anointed one. We are the anointed church to the world. And so it was through this anointing. Jesus was fully God and divine, but he emptied himself of divine prerogatives and he became a man and he lived among us. And it was through this anointing, it was through the power of the living God, it was through the Holy Spirit that he exercised his marvelous ministry. So to the church of Christ today, we exercise our ministry under this anointing. This is the defining feature of the church. Apart from the anointing, King David is, is nothing. Can you imagine if the Spirit of God did not rush upon him? He would not be the mighty man of valor and this champion in war. He would not be able to defeat Goliath. He would not be able to lead a nation. He would not be able to prophesy. He would not be able to write the Psalms apart from God, the Spirit, anointing him and carrying him. In the same way, the church of Christ is nothing apart from the Spirit of God. If you notice within the text, the distinguishment from those who were led away by Antichrist, by false teachers, was the fact that they did not have this anointing. It says, but you have the anointing, right? Those who went out, who were not among them, they did not have this spiritual reality. They were not born again. They did not 
have the power of God upon their lives, but the church is the church because of this anointing from God. I want us to uh, continue and and consider this this principle. There's so much that is said of of Antichrist and and so many different um, thoughts and, and fears and conspiracies. But the best way within the text to be prepared and to resist this spirit and this work of Satan is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If we are proactive, if we are on offense, if the lights are turned on within our soul, we will be able to spot who are the children of darkness and it is it will be natural and organic and will freely flow from those who are walking in this spiritual power. The primary way that this anointing functions within uh, the text, the way John uses it, is to refer to discernment. This gives us wisdom. It gives us understanding to point out who are true teachers and who are false teachers. A child of God may rightly discern by the wisdom given by the Holy Spirit uh, when the grand truths, for instance, of, of Scripture are being exalted or when they are being omitted, when, when Jesus is being lifted up as the Son of God. He is being uh, preached as the exclusive Savior and the path to the Father. Those who are enlightened of the Spirit of God, the children of God, will be able to discern these things. I think the sense is properly put forward in John 10, verse 4. Uh, Our same author uh, gives us uh, these words of of Christ. He he says the following in John uh, chapter 10, verse 4. When he was brought out all of his own, he goes before them. This is speaking of the good shepherd. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This is a perfect illustration of those who are keeping step with the Spirit, those who are abiding in the words of Jesus, who know the voice of God, they're able to point out quickly the stranger and the spirit of Antichrist. And then if we look in John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I will give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand." This is a perfect perspective uh, through which to read 1 John to understand uh, how essential it is for us to abide in Christ, to follow Him. And also we see this theme here of eternal life that is given to the sheep of God, those who know Him, who are walking in His words, who are following after him who know the voice of God. What a sweet text that is. I want you also to reflect on this uh, principle. We understand that one of the functions of Jesus' ministry is that he is a teacher. Jesus is the best teacher teacher on the planet. This is deeply encouraging when you consider our weakness, when we consider that we're like sheep and we have trouble trying to navigate this difficult life to know where to walk and what direction to go. We can appeal and we can call upon Christ. We can listen to his words. We can be instructed on where to walk. Also, we see This language that's used in 1 John referring to the Holy Spirit, he also is a teacher. What encouragement this is to the weak and to the humble and to the true sheep of God that the Holy Spirit is actively working on our behalf in order to teach us through the Word of God in order that we might not be led 
astray with all the cunning and all the deception and the powerful delusions that come from Satan and the spirit of Antichrist that is at work in the world. Um, Look at John chapter 16 as it, it highlights the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. John 16 verse 12 Uh, Jesus speaks to his apostles regarding this Holy Spirit that is to be uh, poured out on all flesh. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. The sense is that they do not have the Holy Spirit. They're not spiritually enlightened. They can't understand these things deep things of the Spirit, verse 13, but when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is one of teaching, it is one of guiding, and it is an active ministry within the church. It is an active ministry within uh, the church that uh, John preached and is an active uh, ministry of the Holy Spirit even today to guide the people of God, according to the Word of God. One of the frustrations of ministry, and I imagine that most of us can relate to this, is having some sort of an understanding of of Scripture and, and trying to help people who are troubled and their life is broken. As a minister, people will often come to me, and and not everybody that that comes to a a minister truly wants to fix the problem. It's uh, kind of funny, but sad at the same time. Sometimes people will come to me and say, Brother William, uh, what does the Bible say about this? And before I have an opportunity to point to a scripture or or try to find a, a word from God, they'll answer the question. And simply, they don't want to find the truth. And, and so many times we, we see others who are on a path to destruction. Their, their life is broken and they continue to repeat the same things that simply destroy their lives. And we realize that if they would just listen to Christ, if they would just come to the Word of God, their whole life could at that moment be changed and they could do a 180 and be set on on the straight path, but in the same way as we consider Jesus as teacher. We consider the willingness of Christ. We consider the willingness of God the Father who holds His hand out to His people. He wants to instruct His people. He wants to speak. He's got many things to say. Jesus has many things to say to us. At the same time, the Spirit of the living God wants to be active in our life. He wants to teach us, but it is essential that we be broken, that we be humble, and that we be teachable. God cannot work with unteachable people any more than we can help those who are not teachable. And so this is the great need of the people of God. I want you to consider this very uh, convicting text uh, by uh, Stephen, uh, who, who says these words in Acts chapter 7, verse 51, as he summarizes the history of Israel. This is the startling indictment that he places upon his own people. Listen to these words. You stiff-necked people, Stephen says, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Notice this word always. It means always. The Holy Spirit wants to move and work, to hover over the waters, to create, to bless, to empower, to instruct. But the problem is Israel, with stony hearts, always resist the Holy Spirit. They killed the prophets, and they killed Christ, and we must be broken before the Word of God. We must be broken before a holy God. We must acknowledge the nature of man and pay ever so close attention that we are not um, 
pushing out, if we are not resisting the voice of God and resisting the work of the Holy Spirit within our life, this is something that we must, uh, with humility, be aware of. And so we think about students and how as they uh, begin, they have little to no understanding. This is encouraging for those of us that want to know more about God, but as they go, as they apply themselves, as they pour themselves over their studies and give long hours, they begin to grow. If this is the way nature is, how much more should this be the same in spiritual things, things that truly matter? How much more essential is it for us to give ourselves to sit in the classroom of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to be instructed in the ways of God and to abide in the teachings of Christ. This is where we're going to be going in the study of of 1 John in, in the future. It's all about, the Christian life is all about abiding in Jesus, abiding in the Word of God. I think about great minds throughout history, academics who have had a ferocious appetite for learning. Many times if you study some of their lives, for instance, uh, Owen, who is the great English theologian, uh, in his early days, he spent himself, such was his appetite to accumulate knowledge, to be the smartest, to be the brightest, to fill his mind with all the knowledge of the the world, classical and and modern and, and, and relevant, that he Uh, hurt his body and he suffered late in life because he had had not slept properly in his his younger years because he had such a desire to accumulate knowledge. This is what should mark the people uh, of God in, in a healthy sense. We should have an appetite. We should be the opposite of those who are indicted in the chapter uh, 7 of Acts who resisted, who wanted nothing to do with God, who were unteachable. But by contrast, we should have a hunger and a desire to feed upon the Lord, to be like David, to declare that his steadfast love is better than, than life, to be like Uh, Moses, who talked with the Lord, to be like Enoch that walked with the Lord, to have that desire as as the the righteous of old, to, to long and to hunger, to commune and to continue with the Lord. And it is in this that we grow into maturity, that we discern what is true and what is false. And it's not um, reasonable for us to be able to be above deception and to be above uh, delusion if we are not to fit um, this illustration that is found in uh, 1 John where he pictures a church that is abiding in the words of Jesus Christ continually. And so this is the path that we want to be led upon um, as we study First John, and then we see um, all the spiritual blessings that, that flow from a life that is within Christ and His Word that maintains this continual fellowship. We see such blessedness as power over sin. Those who are born of, of God, we see that the, the divine attributes are at work within them, that they truly are the ones that lay their life down for their brothers, that they walk in the footsteps of Jesus, and that they cease from sin, and that they walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so this morning, um, I want us to uh, consider what we have uh, said this morning. If, if this is something that you have not tasted of, if you do not understand the, the Christian life, if you have not truly come to know God, which is what the book of 1 John is about, if we know Him, we will be like Him, we will walk in His footsteps. Uh, the good news is that Jesus, the Savior of the world, 
He came to live among us. He assumed human flesh. He lived a perfect life, the life that we could not live. And then he ultimately died in our place. He drank the bitter cup. He was crushed in our place. And he drank the the wrath of of the Father. And he was uh, crucified. He was buried and he rose again on the third day. And we are to look to him. We are to believe on him as the only savior of the world. And then we are commanded to change our mind, to repent, to be baptized, immersed in water, to reenact this death, burial, and resurrection. And in doing this, we have our sins washed away and we receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. If this is your desire, you can do that today. You can come forward, confess Christ as your Savior. If there are any other prayers of the church, we would also encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing our song of invitation.